Another Liquid Bullet Productions with us for the interview today is Mr. Gary Carroll. How are you doing today, Nice Gary? to meet you, mate. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Finally. Well, right, I've got some bullet points here of your life. It's, uh, it's been pretty active, hasn't it? <laughs> oh, I see, mate. All right, so we've got gang life. We've got fighting. We've got military in the powers. French Foreign Legion as well. Wars. Um, Afghan. Iraq. Freelance mercenary. Prison life, doorman as a bouncer, fighting with ISIS, they've even been involved in bombings and blown up. Yeah. Right, so before we get into all of that, can we just go right back to the beginning, how it all started for you? Ah, well, I was born down in Alder, shot down in England, mate, even though I'm from Scotland, Dundee, yeah. Yeah. Army father was in the army, Aiden, and um, obviously the family from Dundee, back to there. And then... 1966, I was born. The year England won the World Cup. Yep. And I remember a good upbringing, mate. Happy days. You know, hard days. Hard upbringing, but we've got good memories of it, mate, yeah? Yeah. Two older brothers, older sister, and uh, another half sister, I wonder, but yeah, close knit family, mate. Close knit, still all here. Yeah. So, what sort of age did, uh, did you come involved with? It was inevitable, mate. My two big brothers were gang leaders, you know. It was inevitable. I was going to follow that path, you know. Yeah. My first arrest was at 14 at a gang. 14, yeah? Yeah, a gang fight. 21 of were arrested on a gang fight on an Easter Sunday, mate, you know. Oh, blimey. I'll never forget, man. I was too young to get charged, and obviously the other 20 lads were, or 18 or 19 or whatever, were going up to court in the morning. And I always remember my mother coming in, you know, and the sergeant looking at me saying, you won't be laughing at that, son, you know. Yeah. It was like that old school, wasn't it, you know? Yeah. My mother came around the corner, took my head off, clapped. And then got around the other corner and then gave us a hug and said, I had to do this, son. <laughs> so it was, mate, you know? Yeah. Uh, that was 14. Obviously, the bad stuff started happening at 16. I was carrying a blade for an early age. 15, I'd admit that. Blimey. You know, very early age. And then, uh, so was that sort of involved with older, older yeah, people? Yeah, it was a dumb major? thing, mate, you know? Especially the area we come from. Knife were prolific. You see what's happening in London nowadays, mate. Yeah, That's why I'm lot. speaking out, mate. You know, my message today is anti knife, anti gun, because I've used the both of them. Yeah. So I feel at 55, I've got to speak up now, mate. You know, yeah. I've got to start delivering my message. Yeah. I, I think if, if you can help 
five, ten people, you know, it's just save yeah. someone else's life by going down that wrong path. I'm getting that, mate, you know, I get a lot, a lot, a lot of lads coming up, you know, up in Scotland, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is why I'm down here, mate, because I feel like I'm doing something and I'm starting to reach people, you know. Yeah. Definitely. So, so what sort of things did you get involved in while you was in the gangs at a young age? <sighs> it was always gang fights, opposite, opposite areas, you know. And anybody coming at you, it was all just nonsense about areas, mate, you know, but, but it was pretty serious. Yeah. You know, when people were carrying lockbacks and fucking open lasers and that, mate, you can't get any serious. Yeah. You know, not not days. All, all my mates, all my young mates went to Boston and detention and why he was not. I was lucky because I was at the boxing at the time. I'd been in the karate for an early age. Everybody done the martial arts in the 70s there. Eh? Bruce Lee. Yeah. Even my yeah. son's called Lee. That's what Bruce Lee. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But, um, I was thinking on it, because I was fit and I was training on that. I went to the Territorial Parachute Regiment at 17. Yeah. Got my wings, got my belly, and then I went regular about a year and a half later. So, so what sort of age did you sort of go into the military as? That's what I'm saying, 17, I was in the Territorial, was so, so I escaped from my lads all going to jails and all that. I got away from that. Yeah. You know? And, and something I, else to concentrate yeah, on. Yeah, and the military should have saved me going to prison, but I never. Because after the, the military, five years later, when I come back onto the doors on Dundee, I was never I've always going to get in bother. Yeah. You know, because I'm not running around with the main players. Yeah. And that's where it led to. It led to me getting a three-year sentence at 27 for an open razor assault. So sorry for what? An open razor, a oh, cutthroat. Me. You know, so I got a three-year sentence for it. And uh, still speak to the lad to this day, no, good mailing. Of the same guy that there got go. cut, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Him. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah, no names mentioned. <laughs> nah, so so what like. prison was it you actually went to? I went to a local Nick Perth prison, but I, I was cut out of here at that time, you know. Yeah. It was a high security prison. And then I was only 18 months, mate. Got eight years for a suit. Yeah. And that was a, a big one, you know, big sentence, you know, called classed as an LTP, a long term prisoner. Because I had bumped to the parachute regiment, he went to the French Foreign Legion after that. And I cut yeah. that out there, you know. I made a short stint over there before I deserted, came home. And um, violence was ripping at me, ripping, ripping at me, you know. I never even needed a weapon, I don't know even why I needed it. Yeah. But because all the guys were doing these things, natural, pff, makes my you know, be firearms. Simple as, you know what I mean? And um, go eight years for a shooting. I actually got 11 years in the High Court, I got a three year sentence for no DNA, no gun, three years for shorting the barrels to less than 24 inches. Yeah. Now when you appeal in, a, in a, a court of law, the High Court judge which sentences you writes a letter to you, he explains why he found you guilty. And in that appeal, he basically wrote to me, this guy thinks he could basically run around his local city and terrorise it without even putting a mask. You basically put that in black and white. So this is how fooled you, 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 you fall into this gangster life, you know what I mean? Yeah. And trust me guys, it don't pay. It don't pay when that door slams mind you every night. You're the one that's up there doing the time. Yeah. Your family, all the rest of it. I've got a mate doing time, no names. And since that short period he's been away now, he's lost his young bra, he's lost his mother. And people in Dundee will know who I'm speaking about, a good mate of mine. But there you go. It's, it's a certain happens, what, like mate, you know. just said there, look, when you were in prison, your family's passing away, you haven't got even time to say goodbye to them, have you? Hard you time, that, mate, yeah, hard time. You chance and you've got to live with that. And then you'll find out who your mates are, and you'll find out who wants to write to you and all the rest of it, then you'll get it around. The, me the message will sink in, mate. Uh, how know? did you find prison? Maybe because I'd been in the military and that, mate, it just come natural to me, you know what I mean? Yeah. To adapt yeah. and be a leader. And, being charged, you just take control of you, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you're basically running a hall, you've got to say the fucking place, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that goes for having prison officers working for you, by the way, bringing in your drugs, bringing in your weapons, bringing in your mobiles, you fucking better believe it to do it, because we had them on the payroll. Facts. I mean, that's facts. Yeah. So can we go into a little bit of your uh, military life? As yeah, sure. You start from the beginning, sort of how it... Yeah. How it started off and how you got well, into it. Well, in, in the 80s, mate, there was nothing happening in the, in the Paris or anything like that. You know, you had Northern, Northern Ireland and they'd done tours and tours and that, but that's not really action what you were looking for, eh? And then, when I came out of prison in 2001, Iraq had been invaded two or three. Mm -hmm. There was a big scream out for private military contractors. Yeah. 
bodyguards, you want to call them that. You're rocking a bit there. Seven man team, fully, fully armed. Glocks, M4s, machine guns, grenades, the full Monty. So it was hardcore. And, and I, I think a lot of the guys over there seen more action there than what half the British Army seen in 22 years. Yeah. You know, he got the mammal. Because a guy wears a medal in the army, you've seen him going to be out of bling. Never shot a bullet in the life. Never killed anybody in the life. I've got 22 medals in <laughs> It's a joke someone about me, you know? Yeah. You're going to get medals in, in what, what we, we do for a living, mate, you know? Like fighting ISIS and all that. You're going to get medals for that, mate. Yeah. So, so you actually come across ISIS, didn't you, yourself? Uh, I went over there in 2015. They were running the mock. And because I'd been in the Middle East and I knew it quite well, I'd been over there for 207, 208. Tell a lie. 204, 205, 206, 207, I was born up near roadside bomb. Spent three weeks in intensive care in uh, Landstuhl, Germany. Broken back, smashed hands, all the rest of it. We've actually got a bit of footage of you yeah. in, the, in the bombing scene we can uh, flip to again. Say, what lucky to be here, mate, you know. Now, that was a blessing in disguise straight away, mate. But I uh, got fit, got myself back to fitness again, and still went back there in 2015, paid more money over Can we just go back to the, obviously, talk, talk us through the bombing? So, was it like, a, did you see it coming or didn't know nah, where it was? Well, it just... what happened is uh, the Americans gave me a report and they reckoned there was uh, nine 155 shells, that's a big artillery shell, yeah. rigged up together, right? Command wire. And we had a new general we were bodyguarding that day, General Dortmo. And we're on our way home after a thousand mile trip. Four days. We're 15 kilometres from the front gate when I heard that my earpiece, a Romeo 1, and I went, fucking hell, we're home. And I was in the rear gunship at the time shooting. Took my rifle and put it between my legs. Took my seatbelt off, and when I clicked that, boom, the bomb went off. And I knew, and the instant when the vehicle went black, I just picked up and just threw it down the road like a stone. Mate. I'm bouncing around inside it, I remember coming up, woke up on, on the hard stuff on the, on the surface. But uh, yeah, that was. Was that instant? Did you feel the pain of your, your back? I don't remember enough? every single thing about that, that, that whole, even in the vehicle. I remember it. People say, I remember it like that. And my drills kicked in. I woke up, my eyes woke up, and the first thing I went for was, was my rifle, because it's always attached to you. Yeah. Oh, and I remember trying to get my rifle to, to, to help us to, 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 you, you've got pictures coming in your head that you're going to get to the prison, you know? Yeah. And that wasn't there. Like, you know, I went in front, rolled on my back, I had a cross to trying to get my pistol out, ain't there. Well, that was there, but there's no feeling. I looked at this hand, it was like a boxing glove, but that was dangling down there, dislocated. It made sense. I went, right, my hand's fucking broke, mate. Right, use your left. Trying to get that over, that had been snapped in half. So you couldn't move your no, I mean, See all this, uh, save the last boat for yourself. Never worked like that on that day for me, mate. Because we used to always buy into that. Oh, if you get surrounded, mate, save the last round, you know what I mean? Before you so get that, caught. So that's what you've done? If you oh, that's a mentality, yeah, 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 mate. You ain't getting fucking captured from ISIS or that, are you? Yeah, Whoa. nah. Nah. they would be tortured and... Well, you've seen the videos. You've seen all yeah. the beheading heading videos, mate. Yeah, beheading. heading and... Brutal, mate, yeah. So that was it. You bought an uh, save the last round for yourself, mate, yeah? And uh, it never worked like so that. So you wouldn't have even been able to do that if I was going to you. Precisely, mate. And you're thinking lying there, oh, my team's running away and left us. Drove away. But they ain't. And they've seen in the mirror, boom, the smoke going off. And then uh, they come back and they're drills. Yeah. And the next man I had, Steve, ex oil marine, slapped me. Guys, I've got you, mate. I've got you. He's scanning his arcs, you know. Paramedic tried to put uh, drips in, mate. Somebody says, young Alex, the driver's uh, unconscious. And the first thing I've learned, uh, I've started dragging it out, apparently. And says, sort Alex, sort Alex. He had a broken back as well. Me and him were the only two severe casualties. And, uh, yeah, I never got uh, I never got pain relief until we got into the camp. What actually happened was a helicopter came over. And you know, one of the guys done his drills, popped the smoke, tried to bring him in. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and took off. Because obviously that, that is the modus operandi, eh? they wait on your landing, get your casualties on and then click, they've got the sick one waiting. Yeah. So he was only doing, doing what he thought, right, and took off and then the team leaders made a command decision, he went, right, get gas in the vehicle. 
It might even make a movie of you got a broken back. Nah, it's a fact, right. you know. Just threw his in the back of the seat. Took off 15 kilometres right in the front gate. And um, it was happy Larry time, you know. Yeah. Woke up in Germany, mate. So when, um, when you're obviously out there, and you, do you know that you don't really know the ISIS are, do you? Because they just blend in as normal people. Or? No, 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 no. no. I, I, ISIS were probably, and I say this easily, the hardest core enemy which probably come the century, not the century, probably, probably in time. They recruited from worldwide, yeah. which meant Afghanistan, Lebanon, Pakistan, Birmingham, you fucking name it, they were there, mate, right? And they were hardcore. So you had hardcore jihadis, what were prepared to die running with vests on. Yeah. We used to call them zombies, mate, because they needed a headshot. Hell. And you see all this, uh, Kanan and uh, Al Akbar, nonsense, mate, they were full of everything, man. That's why they were taking shots, three and four, and bouncing up, mate, you know what I mean? They were on everything, mate. We were That's finding stacks of drugs, mate, everywhere. And the houses, and the houses were always ready to go as well. So that ah, was a naughty place. So, so they must be like, always looking over your shoulder. You couldn't relax while you're there, surely. At like, one point, at one point, mate, the, the, the worked out that when I was in Kirkuk, we were getting seven suicide bombs a day to the front line where I was, we were in trenches at the time. And this is when the attacks took place in Paris. Yeah? Yeah. When uh, they were running a bit like Charlie Hebdo, yeah, all the attacks on the, uh, in Paris. And we were in uh, the actual trenches at the time, so we never had any internet and that, so we never knew that was going on. Yeah. And I always remember looking over and seeing, like the Baghdad Blitz, you know, the bombs going off, boom, boom. Yeah. They were getting hit for coalition. And this is because this had happened in Paris. We never knew this. So when we got back to the camp, back there, like three or four days, we were on this we, we shot mission. And uh, I think you've seen the footage. Yeah, I sent you some footage yeah, where yeah. I, I went into the hospital. We've got there two hours too late and the doctor's been beheaded. They've got eight of them out of the beds. They butchered them. So just as we went into the, into the hospital, you, you see you see the blood trails and that and that bit of footage I've took one, yeah. one, one, one of them, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, that was, well, you can see how fresh that was when I'm standing in the gate's brains, mate, you know what I mean? I've got there a bit, must have been about an hour too late when we, when we rolled through that gate. And they took off, you know? Yeah. But uh, that, was, that was hardcore, that, mate, you know? How does that sort of mentally sit with you, seeing all that sort of stuff and well, people being beheaded and... I used Must to call, I, yeah, 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 mate, yeah. I used to call it being weak, right? I used to go, ah, oh, fucking one curse, you know? And that's drilled in you for an early age in the parlors, you know? Yeah. No, no, complaining about it, you know? You just got on with it. But after the bomb, mate, the Americans made me take a year's counselling for uh, post traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing over there, you know? They were miles ahead of us. Yeah. That's all the charities have popped up now, eh? All these yeah. veteran causes and all these charities and everything up and down the country, mate. There was none of that. None of that before I've gone and all that, was it? So, Americans, because of Vietnam, they were miles ahead of us, mate. They knew this. They knew that when people get injured, they then get weak. No matter how strong you are. I mean, you've seen photos of me, I was a bodybuilder back in the day and everything. Broken back, injuries and that, it takes its toll, mate, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Metal plates and foots and everything, it takes its toll. Well, if you've got a titanium plate in the stomach. They brought a sniper in, mate, believe that. Well, this is a true story. I've only told many people this one. The sniper took a shot. And I was standing like this, me and you. Me and a guy called Victor. And the round came in, zipped to me, and the hole in the wall was like that. It was fucking like that. It was shot. So when we went back and seen it like about 12 hours later, sneaked it and looked at it, and there's a fucking hole that shit. I was like, wow. I went, and I just never realised that it zipped as that. It came in that close, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I spoke to snipers about this one. And they went, if he's that good, mate, he's actually aimed for the middle, he goes, because they expect the round to drift off. Yeah. And because it's been two years, if he's been a good distance out, he probably has aimed for the middle, rather than going for a left or a right shot. Yeah. He's probably been that good, it's landed where he wanted it, but he's expected the round to drift, you know what I mean? If he's far up. But that is what it is, mate. So, really, you was... <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that close, mate. Yeah. You know, but then again, I've been in that uh, circumstances that got loads of things, mate, well, fucking around the safe. At the time, I was in the rear vehicle, as we call a gunship. This is the gunship. See that? One, two, yeah. three, four, five, six. Do you see? No boys' vehicles damaged.
I've got two assassinations attempts, mate. <laughs> when rungs have went past my head. So, so what, what sort of daily things did you come against while you was out there working, doing the uh, military stuff? What, what, did, what did your daily routine be of? So, oh, no, no, well, well, I was a team leader, so I was in charge of men, mate, you know, so yeah. you'd bounce up and you'd do your brief at seven in the morning, you'd get your team together and you'd go out and if you were like bodyguard, if you want to call that, mate, on the PMC work, you'd go around certain sites and do it and we were, because we were on a Department of Defence contract working for the American government, right? We were like, ah, uh, our clients were US generals, mm. military. We were technically civilians. Even though we're ex-soldiers, South African Special Forces, ex legion players, whatever, we were technically civilians. Yeah. But we were in charge of military. That was crazy, you know? And that was the first thing that probably ever happened in, in the British military, that, that they had to work hand in hand with ex-soldiers, civilians. They called us the Gucci guys, you know, because we had all the best of gear for the American government and the big wages and all that, you know? Yeah. Like 325 quid a day at the start. And obviously it got diluted and diluted as the years went on. Yeah, cool. Well, that is what it is, mate. You know? So how many of you was actually out in a team together? Seven on the ground, probably, yeah. So it's not a lot, really, because no. you could be up against... No. Just, no. Yeah. And, now, in 2004, when I was working, there'd be a three-man team, right? So you'd be in a car and a vehicle behind me, right? Sierra. And you'd have three locals. I'd be in the middle with a client, three locals, or up front. So there's only a three-man team. So when the shit hits the fan, mate, you can guarantee that these guys are going to lose the plot and you're down to a three-man team. Yeah. And you ain't got any ugly call signs like military calling and airstrikes or that. You're on your fucking own yeah. up there, mate. You're in the boondocks, you know? A few naughty, naughty escapes in places like Nazaria and Baghdad and the Crete and all these naughty places, man, you, you, you were there. You don't need a vehicle to go down, mate. Yeah. And you're on the radio, oh, guys, my vehicle's down. No, you're fucking stuck. And if you're on a boat up area, mate, you're in a bad place. Can you, so, can you talk us through any sort of situations you've been in where, uh, or just talk us through sort of where you've gone in and had to go into battle, etc.? Well, uh, the, the, fear, the fiercest was definitely over, over in Syria, mate, that's what I'm saying. Because you were classed as a mercenary, right? You weren't meant to be there, you paid your own flights. You were now working with a team of like, maybe you for America, America, ex-Special Forces, Green Berets, a Canadian guy with two New Zealand SARS guys who had went AWOL just to go there for the action, you know? Because yeah. you're getting trigger time, mate, for real. You're getting kills there. Yeah. Simple, you know? And legal kills at that, mate. But you're coming home and then it's all there, eh? The police have got the file on you, special branch of there. They know what's going on, mate, you know? They've got a file that size on you, mate. And you're fucking tripping them, you don't think they're off, because they're off. Yeah. I've seen mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you're, you're there for that reason. So, uh, can you talk us through sort of uh, having to shoot and shoot people and stuff like that for war t situation? Well, listen, listen. I've always said this to people, I say. How do you justify, or how do you beat a guy with a vest on, right? This is a new thing, mate. Guys are running with vests and they're ready to bam. And these guys believed in what they were doing. Yeah. Or they were out there not that much, as I told you. That, that, that's just unheard of. We brought up in the military to take a prisoner, give him Geneva Convention, food and water, like what the guys done in Falcons and all that, right? Yeah, Looked after the poor Aldis. You can't right. touch them, can you? But when you you've gone up against guys like that, what have been radicalised, that was the word. And a lot of them went on the internet and they just got the fucking edge of mince, mate, right? Radicalised. Yeah. That a lot of them actually did believe. Uh, they, were, they were going to 72 virgins or whatever they want to call it, paradise. But, um, nah, heavy duty, mate, you know? Yeah. Heavy duty. So, so what was the main sort of take them out as soon as they're in sight? Oh, yeah. No, just... And even, even back to in Iraq, we were bodyguarding, mate. We had a bubble. Now, if you go on the internet and you Google, I uh, shouldn't be saying this on camera, but I'm going to say it because there's more company ages. It's called the Aegis Trophy video. Google it. Check it out. And you'll see five shootings on it where they brought the FBI in to actually investigate the teams that were shooting at the vehicles. Really? Because if anybody come, well, you have a sign on the back of your vehicles, and there were legalised shootings, by the way. Let's get it straight. There were legal shoots. 
The guy had got paid off for the company, went back home, juggled the videos, added a bit of Elvis to it, yeah. train arriving, yeah, yeah. and all you seen is the boats coming out of the vehicle, but you're, not, you're not getting the real footage what actually happened. Yeah. You hear the guy, fast mover to the rear, going to the team leader. Team leader then gives him permission to throw the flashbang, to warn them. They know not to come too near you, mate. They know not to go up your arse. Because when you've got bombs and up in them vehicles, mate, and there come, a couple of my mates got out with vehicles, but it's called a V-bed, vehicle born IED. And you've got a car loaded up, and it's sitting like that, because it's that loaded up with whatever, ordnance. And that's looking for a target, and that's rocking into you, mate. You're gone. Yeah. There's only one way to stop that, mate. The machine goes in the back for a reason. As soon as that vehicle comes in that bubble, fucking engage. And you ain't got all the time to go through all these drills and that. And nah, the guy's got a lot. Of, yeah, he's got to me. He's got to get right on that trigger and do his job, mate. Because if he doesn't, he's going to come past you and maybe wipe your mates out or the client. Yeah. So, so when you was actually out there doing, doing this work, did you actually get given like a daily job or are you just patrolling? Yeah. You've got a daily job every day, mate, yeah. We were working seven days a week, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And us guys were probably putting more work in than Brit Miller and everything. I used to look at some of them and go, yeah, they're lucky if they're going out to get once every four or five days. Yeah. Well, we, were, we were out there every single day, seven days a week. So, so was you guys brought in to like, as a protection yeah. team and, for and that? Yeah, because, and because they knew they were paying that kind of heavy-duty money, the American government, they were getting a work out of you, mate, you know? Yeah. Now jump forward from that into ISIS, man, you'd paid your own flights, you'd paid for your own boats and your rifles and everything you sell, mate, your own pocket. You're obviously there for a reason, eh? Yeah. Only oh, you ain't playing with full deck, mate, you only get a couple of kills, it's one of them, innit? Yeah. Or you believe in good and bad. Evil. Because they were on the internet cutting off edge. They were yeah, years. That, that was a big thing, wasn't it? When that first started happening, it was a massive impact. Massive I, impact, I remember the yeah. first one I saw, it was a bit of a shocker. Like to be honest, right, they were very, very clever, right, in, in switching against us. And all they've done is backfired what we were doing to them. They seen the guys in the orange jumpsuits, right? Yeah. Guantanamo Bay. Oh, you want to do that to us? Get an orange jumpsuit, next that good. People. Yeah. And, and these guys were going in like, uh, maybe, maybe like, we call them geeks, you can't no, no, fix internet or whatever and that. And, Going, or journalists, yeah, journalists, every journalist. So that was a new thing in journalists getting killed, mate, you know what yeah. I mean? And every war a journalist has been respected, even Vietnam. Yeah. But over there, journalists yeah. were the target, mate, you know? Yeah. And so the world's changed. Doing, wasn't it? Just taking, like, civilians, innocent civilians and uh, definitely, making an Definitely, mate, yeah. And using children and that as that's cover. Right. And that's yeah. what they're, they're notorious for, mate, you know? And as I say, the world's changed. It's a different place now, mate. If me and you decided to go abroad tonight and go, I'll tell you what, mate, we'll, we'll go here, we'll go there. You can't. Yeah. In the old days, they were able to put that on and go backpacking and whatever. Yeah. Oh, we're going to see Afghanistan, we're going to... Them days are gone, mate. Yeah. And I'm going to give you a fact that the world, it sickens me sometimes. Like, so I go up there and I watch a taxi driver going past me and I go, he's living in fantasy world, you don't know what's going on in the world. Syria's flattened. Iraq, no more, flattened. Just look around, Afghan, flattened. Look what's happened in the last three days. Taliban took Afghan. Fifteen years of losing soldiers over there, all the deaths, right? For America, for Britain, and the Danes and Canadians, and all the, all the deaths. Taliban have took Afghanistan back in the last three days, mate. Yeah, yeah. Overrun it. So a lot of it, we don't need to only got to see what the media wants to exactly, show you, Exactly, mate. You? It's so media. you've seen it hands Yeah, that's hands what I'm saying, on. media, you know what I mean? And then when you've been to places like that, mate, you know, and you've seen it. In your room at night, listening to the rockets coming in, blowing up everything around you, going out in the morning, knowing that somebody has just been taken out on that very fucking road. Fire! Fucking get the floor! Out of me, 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 Bastards popped up, man. Tell you what, it's just me. I know, mate. It just, just happened, mate. It's I know. There's no other smoke. Yeah. Some fucking pop, mate. Senor. Yeah, because the smoke very short. It's been some bang like that. Yeah. Iraq was Mesopotamia, mate. It was the cradle of civilization. You know? Babylon. 
been there. The ziggurat in Abraham's tomb, it's called. It's older than the pyramids. Yeah. It's in Nazaria, you know. Wow. And the youngs just went and pfft, up everything, did it? Blew it all up. Yeah, mate. <laughs> yeah. I was in Nazaria, mate, right, and the locals were complaining because the Americans were bulldozing. And they're throwing sandbags with this historical site. It should have been getting excavated and they've just thrown their sandbags with it, mate, you know, they want to give it to the monkeys. Oh, mate. So they're probably you. upsetting the actual people there, like, by doing all that. Big stuff. time. And yeah. recruiting you. Yeah. And let's go straight right in on their politics or religion. I try not to have full faith now, right enough. Well, for the life of being a devil, but uh, I do. I do believe in it now. And I've got a bit of faith. But if you look, religion and the politics side and that. I always try to keep away from it and I'll keep out of it, you know, because yeah. my view's not gonna change anything, innit? You never hear me campaigning anti drugs and that, ain't gonna stop out there, innit? No. Right. You know? Knives and guns, yeah, I feel I've got something to say because I've been sentenced in the high court for it, so it's different. And I've served the time for it, the hard time guys. And I'm telling you right now, I don't fucking pay. Crime don't pay. Trust me. Go and get your wee job, get your wee house, get your little holiday once a year, get your dog, get your missus and you'll be happy and you'll be rich at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, trust me. Okay, uh, yeah, can I just touch on obviously, um, you actually joined the French Foreign Legion at some point as well. Yeah, you? after after the uh, Paris, mate. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but obviously my theory on that from years ago was mainly like people that were trying to escape or criminals or, or people on the run would run to the French Foreign Legion and they, yeah. they had trouble to get out of it, is that correct? Right. That was back in the early days, mate, you know? Yeah. After the Second World War, a lot of the Nazis escaped to the religion. Yeah. Some of the songs are still in German now, you know, the French songs. And, um, in Camarade and all that, they came from the, the Nazi side of it. But they put these guys in, uh, Vietnam, Indochina. And they actually had German battalions. But were beating the Viet Minh at the time, but once the French politicians found out what was going on, then, Team Penfew fell, that was a big battle over there with, with the French Paris, right, the Legion and all the rest of it. Yeah, they did accept murderers in the ring, right? You go to the Foreign Legion now and try and recruit, probably one of the, one of the most elite regiments in the world, do you written now and that, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah. it's changed to what it is? Yeah, because they're getting ex-Paris, ex-Marines from all around the world, want them just be a legionnaire. Yeah. Get your five year and get your French passport, all the rest of it, so a lot of the Ukraine and all these Poles and everything, they, they go there, you know what I mean? Yeah. Eastern Bloc to try and get a French passport. And so that. How, how did you end up going, getting into that, signing up with them? There was a, lot, a couple of good mates of mine, Dundee lads over there, Dick Fergie, Jock McGregor, and that, good, good, good lads, and uh, they were in the French Paris. My mate, Gary White, rest of them, God rest of them, Lindsay, rest in peace, and uh, they were over there at the time in uh, the French Paris, the Legion, Museum Rip. And my older cousin, Alex, I found out had done five years in the Legion. Shout out to you, Alex Kennedy. I'll see you soon up in Dundee, mate, when you come up. And um, nowadays, as I say, it's all changed. I've got the, the doozy, mate. They take your, your blood, tattoos, photographs, and it goes to Interpol. Yeah. So if you're wanted, mate, you're just in two seconds, mate. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. But yeah, they did, they did take more of those back in the old days, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fuck. Yeah. yeah. So what other, what other war stories have you got for us? What have you sort of. What's, what stands out in your mind as one of the worst situations you've been in? Worst? You always get asked this with people, well, what do you think is the worst situation? <laughs> I'm like, well, uh, to be can, fair, can you, get, can you get any more scarier? Right, think about this, right? Then, have you been under a mortar barrage, right? Now, a mortar, what, what they'll do is they'll drive about his side in a car in a vehicle. They'll maybe have a three man mortar team. One guy will jump out, they'll put in a mortar place, base plate. Another lad will have the tube, boom. Another guy might have the four mortar bombs. 16, 12, whatever he's got, bump, bump, and now when they come in, they're landing anywhere. So if one lands close to you, right, you'll go on the ground, you'll and go, fucking hell, that was cool, boom. And the next one, where's the next one coming? You don't know. So it's a really, really scary situation you're in now, because all you hear is crump, boom, crump, boom. And I've been under 18 of them landing, trust me, it ain't fucking nice, mate, you know what I mean? I was right under the vehicle, all right right under the but. But it's where it's landing, isn't it? You just don't know, you know, bump, 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 because yeah, they're indiscriminate. It's not like a, a gunshot where you can sort of run exactly. and get away from it. It's, and it's these, going to be and random. And these guys have got it off to a tee, mate, and, and they'll drop that, that mortar tube back quick and throw it back in the vehicle and, and scoot off, mate, and all they're, they're clever, you know what I mean? They know what they're doing, you know? 
And as I say, they'll, they'll go anywhere. I've got pictures, mate, uh, where, where one landed, uh, the guy, he was just about five beds down from me, like, and they were like hooches. Like, like old caravans, right? The hooches. Oh, I'll mind you. And the guy, true story this, he'd actually discovered that if he went around the corner and he, the satellite come around at a certain time of night, he got his phone call, his missus at six o'clock, right? But he kept this to himself, being a clever, clever right? And he was lying there on his internet, playing with his laptop, and he looks at the phone, oh, two minutes. And he starts complaining. He jumps up, and he heads to the door. Just as he gets to the door, the mortar comes right through the roof, right through his tall bed, mate, right? And blew him about 20 feet away, mate. He got up and put a mark on him, right? Yeah. And I've got a photograph of his huge, right? You know, at night time, you want to know what he was complaining about? His laptop. <laughs> <laughs> See, I guess the fucking laptop's through, and I was like, oh, wow, have you seen your huge, man? I'm like, oh. Yeah. We've, oh. all, we've all worried about you just to escape yeah, death. Yeah, mate. It was, it was like, like a banana, mate. I'm just sitting there like that. He tells me it was just selling like a banana peel. And I'm going, wow. And he's worried about his fucking laptop. <laughs> yeah, true, mate, yeah. So, so what other stuff's happened during the war you can share with us? Well, that's what I'm saying. Shoot, shoot people. What, 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 what? How, how does that take a toll on you actually shooting someone? Can you talk us through it a little bit of us? It bother me, mate. It's like, nah. you know, see, when I, I've always said this to people, right? I could never touch an animal, right? I'm a dog lover. I've got a staffy over the dog. And even a pussy cat, I could never touch animals. See a human being. Yeah. People want to sleep in two seconds, mate. Yeah. The most evilest creature on this planet is a human being. Yeah, Trust I me, agree mate. with you, mate. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. 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 But nah, no compunction me putting somebody to sleep, no. No. It's, it's never had play with you. Nah. You never had flashbacks of no, things no, you've had to no. do and stuff. No, and I've done it in a war zone and I've done it out of war zone. Yeah. Facts. Taking yeah. life. Not proud of it either. Yeah. But there you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, that's facts. And uh, people have always said as well, we violence, right? See violence in our age, whether it's been a tumbler, whether it's been a hammer, whether it's been a baseball bat, whether it's been knives, guns, it's all been used. Right through my life, mate, and at the time I never really thought about it. Just come natural. Yeah. Where well, the badness come from, I don't know. I look back now and I'm disgusted, mate. Yeah. I really am, I'm disgusted, you know. Do you mind if, can we go back into some of that past? I'm not stabbing people like that, yeah. But I, I've, it's, it's funny, right, because I always had this theory of being, once you get into bodybuilding, you learn this ectomorph, endomorph, mesomorph, and that, right? So if you're not actually a big lad, you go on the juice, you start taking the steroids, right? Yeah. You start getting bigger. I go up to be 16 stone, whatever. Now, if a guy comes in here and he's 24 stone, I've got to look at him and say, can I bang him out? And I can't bang him out. And I've got to go and get a, an equalizer straight away. It's, yeah. it's the rule of thumb. Man, it's some of the most violent people I've met have been five feet four. Yeah. You've know, only got to look at London, mate. The crazy on that five foot seven. Yeah. It's a fact, you know what I mean? It's got nothing to do, do with the do, size do of the muscles. I know that your, your sort of military training sort of give you that upper hand. Yes, definitely. You're, you're trained to kill, right? Uh, so and and, an, and, an and you're, 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 you're trained a thought, well done. Because, or maybe that's if you've been a leader, you'll plan things. Mm. And I'll tell you one thing, I've ever planned anything. I went fucking sweet as I know that for a fact. You know? I've been in prison three times and I've never heard about a fucking DNA or a statement against me ever. Yeah. Apart from the first one, I'd have slashing, but there you go. Yeah. Fucks. So, so that mindset, though, for that the, the training you've obviously been through is sort of it's for, to kill, isn't it? It's not to, it's not like a street fight where you're just going to have a knuckle up. So no, that well, must come well, into. Well, well, well right, right, there's, there's a good one, right? People say, oh, he's a bare knuckle and he's a BKB and he's this and he's that. And I'm saying, is that not what we were fucking doing from day one, guys? Having a straightener. Mm. No, if I went for a square go as a young guy, my brothers made me have square goes with guys, right? And that was a fuck. Well, it was fast. It was head. It was that. It was biting. It was gouging. It was all fucking allowed, mate. You always wore steel toe caps. Yeah. Fuck. Put the boot in. If you were going for a straightener, you wore steely dance. It's a fact, mate. Yeah. You knew you were breaking bones. You knew you were breaking fucking heads, mate, when you put the boot in. Fuck. Yeah. And it's not about kicking him when he's down. It's about making him stay down, mate. Yeah. You know? It's got to be a fine line there as well. And I always went back and big people up like that. Or when I seen other guys taking liberties and I'd go, he's hard enough. You know, you see guys queuing up like penalty kicks and everything, wow. You yeah, know what I mean? Come on, the, the guys are, uh, the guys are enough. Kick a man while he's down. But there you go, that is what it is.
Yeah. Did, did you ever have any unarmed combat while you was in the, uh, in the military, like when you was at war? And well, as I say, we turned with martial arts, mate, it come natural to me, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I really wanted to, uh, it went from karate to kickboxing, to kickboxing to boxing, and that, so it was just combined, didn't it? Yeah. It's combined. Yeah. And yeah, all well, my mates are I'm 55 now, eh? some of my mates are still training. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, have, have you found it now since you sort of come out of the military and stepped away from your injury? How sort of. Injuries, sort of have, you come injuries have made me weak, right? And, and I'm an older man now, I'm getting older and wiser, right? So, I've turned my back on it, mate. Yeah. I really have turned my back on it. You're lucky, to be fair, you're lucky to be alive for now, aren't you? I know that now. Looking back, I, I realise that. A lot that of now. people don't survive a broken back, do they? But, uh, nah, nah, and the injuries have had. And uh, time has made me a mellow person now, mate, you know? Maybe he was angry when I was younger, I don't know. I don't know where it came from, you know? Yeah. How, how was that recovery with your back, sort of? Nah, it's a, I'm in pain every day, mate, you know, but every is day. it you learn? Hey, I mean, you look at guys with no legs, and I, and I, I feel like a, a fake some days, you know what I mean? I'm going, yeah. like, you're moaning, you're complaining, and you're that poor lad's got no legs. Yeah, there's always and, someone with a worse yeah, situation. I had a mate, Vinny took a strike, mate, lost his two legs in his arm. Wow, what legs that guy got? But he's out there every day. Yeah. So, do, do you have any regrets, or do you wish you took a different path in life, or would you actually say you might say you've not got any regrets here in life? You know what I mean? Yeah. Of course, we've got good regrets. Mate. Was, any, any are, are you glad with mind. that life you chose, like the military stuff? Because that that's quite a good, good livelihood to have. And I wouldn't have changed anything, though, mate. You know yeah. what I mean? No, I wouldn't. No. I've been with my wife Michelle what thirty-three years. My young lad's thirty-one. Yeah. He's a football coach up in Scotland. Never been in trouble in his life. So it shows you, you're a victim of your circumstances, mate. Yeah. My mother brought four of up on her own. <laughs> you know what I mean? Never had a chance. We never. Yeah. I've not got a qualification in my name, but I'm got, I get told every day, oh, you're a clever man, you're an intelligent man. I ain't got a qualification. You know? I think the army gives you the sort of, um, not it's like a qualification, but when you come out of the army, it's easy to get a job. You can go into different different areas, can't you? Because yeah, you're, you're but qualified not for a paratroop, I've got to jump through an aeroplane well, I mean, and, like and shoot some machine gun, mate. Security-wise, no. though, no. you'd be educated yeah. in. And but anybody ever going, oh, I'm going to join the military now, you go out, well, go to the RAF and go and get a trade, or, you know what I'm saying, mate? You're yeah. trying to point them, I'll go to the Navy and get a trade, and then, yeah, you can go outside and be an HDV or mechanic. Yeah, I get that, what you're saying, but in the parachute regiment, which is probably why we'll end up in fucking prison, mate. You know what I mean? <laughs> there you go, there's an answer for that one. <laughs> so, you know? to, just, just talk through the training of the like, paratroop Ah, it's hard, mate, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, it, yeah definitely. The most so, how long was you sort of training for that? Six months training, down in the parachute training. regiment, mate. But uh, that's taking your parachute training course in that for a month as well. But, uh, yeah, very, very fit mob, mate, you know? Yeah. Very, very fit mob. Yeah. So, what, obviously, you have something you wanted to do is jump out of a plane. <laughs> What's that first jump like? <laughs> I've done a lot of jumps, mate. You know, I've been I've been lucky. I've jumped through a fucking aeroplanes and I've jumped through a American Huey helicopters. I've jumped through a German Jolly Green Giants. I've jumped through a Transals. I've been lucky, mate. And the old balloons in the day, they've done balloon jumps as well, which they yeah. don't get to do nowadays either. Well, like a hot air balloon, you're talking about? Yeah, well, well, it was like that. A big air balloon and they took you up in a cage. Oh, right. And that was meant to be the most scariest jump, but no, I've done, done, done a few of them. And they take you up and there's only four fours in the cage and the little pole gets moved away. It's a drop, it's a 200 feet drop before the parachute gets tugged, yeah. you know. But yeah, they even, they even done that with the motorway cuts, they cut that back as well, mate. So it's a shame the lads don't get the dubling jumps now, you know. Yeah. That was part of your parachute course that will qualify for your wings, mate. Yeah, so did you actually um, did you actually jump in when you went to the, your tours, your wars? Nah, you nah, that's, uh, you know something, you'd be lucky if the British Army had a few of them in, in the history, mate, that's called the combat jump, you're on. Right. If you actually jump into an action like Suez Canal and that, right, that's called a uh, combat jump, because you're combat jumping jump. into, yeah, that's different, you know, yeah. very, very, like the Germans jumped on a crate and they were combat yeah. jumps, you know what I mean, they yeah. them a combat jump, so very rarely, you know what I mean? Yeah, so what were the first tours you first done with the uh, military? Oh, we, we were unlucky, mate. We, we got stuck in Norway, believe it or not, with, with the Marines, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Done a few tours in Norway, mate, wow. And that was for three months at a time as well. But then again, it was Arctic warfare. Yeah. So you done, done a month's Arctic warfare and then they put you way up north and that. And uh, 
skiing and all that kind of the army. Yeah, it was good, yeah. But fit as well, you know. You, you must have had some good times in the army, don't you? That's what I'm saying. Oh, happy days, mate. Yeah, some, happy uh, days, mate. Funny, yeah. Have you got any funny stories you can think of you can tell us? Some, some legendary stories, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, let's see them, girl. Probably, <laughs> pro probably starting barroom brawls, mate, you know. <laughs> there, was, there was a pub down in uh, Salisbury. Yeah. I, I always remember this one. It was called the Saxon Warrior for some reason, right? Yeah. And uh, I had a holiday booked to Spain on uh, uh, two days later or so, and we were going on leave. Yeah. So it was about four of us chipped in, like, yeah, we'll no Cyprus or something, something crazy like that. We were going on holiday. And we went down to this pub, and because we'd been drinking it so long, the, the bar staff actually took our side. There was another regiment up the road called the Duke of Wellington Regiment, the Duke of Boots. So it was a lot of rivalry. You know? The boxing team used to jog blast with the. With the they were hated, you know, we were always banging them out. Every time, we were, every, every opportunity we were banging them out, mate, right? And um, it just bad luck. We went in for uh, somebody leaving, so it was 40 when they were 30, and they had a similar do next door. Yeah. It was inevitable, it was brewing, you know? And when it kicked off, I still remember to this day when uh, the RMPs, like the Motley Police, when they, when they surrounded it, mate, right? You know what I mean? It was like a bomb had hit. The windows were all caved in, the bar staff were under them. People were cut left, right and centre. I think there were three or four of them on the opposite side got, got civilian jail for it, mate. Really? Yeah, we were all put really? on fucking parade the next day and that. And all the boys were trying to buy my holiday ticket and I was going, you're fucking in. <laughs> the RSM come up and just shouted out about 20 names. and mean, we were at the top of it, was it? Boom. And we all got pulled aside. And then they bring in the Maltry uh, CID. Uh, SIB, they're called the Maltry. Side of like, like the criminal CID, and then they interviewed her. Oh, and, mate, they even had fucking photographs of oh, and you were seen at this pool table playing pool and that. The other, <laughs> yeah, the other, uh, I'm like, oh, no, I wasn't me, man. I, I went in for an orange juice, I left early. I said, because we, we were going on holiday in the morning and that, and all that. They knew, but when the bar staff came down and, and I'd wall up, just on the other side, another started pointing fingers and all. Yeah. And I was, uh, I remember about six of them went to jail, yeah. Went to prison for it, but I was legendary that one, the six and warrior, yeah. Okay, can I just touch on, obviously, in, in, when you're on tours and more, you probably lose your sort of friends and team around you, don't you? Which mate, you, I've lost a lot. I've lost a lot. How does that impact mate. you? Because obviously one minute you're, you're there, next minute they've gone. I was worked out, I was worked out that, but we went through the figures, um, I'd lost um, 11 mates over 36 months, and that's a lot. I think right. one every 12 weeks. That was even a lad for Dundee who died in, and he flew out there with me as well. Uh, big Andy, Andy White, God rest him. And um, we'd flew in uh, Kuwait to go for London, he thought. Uh, Andy was killed on the Monday, we worked in an ambush. But um, yeah, when, when you, we started counting, going through a short period of time, it's yeah. said, I have a little ball that you're putting it to the back of your head, putting it to your back. This is where the post mark side comes in. It gets explained to you that people like me are the hardest to deal with. Yeah. Or treat, you know why? Because you just keep putting it to the back of your head, putting it to the back of your head, mate. Yeah. At some point, it's going to give. To, otherwise, you're going to end up. Yeah, well, but down, at yeah. some point, it's going to give, isn't it? Yeah. And then when you get injured, then you're weak. That's when it gives, because you're, you're, you're weak as yeah. here. So then, that's when your emotions come forward. Yeah. Well, that's when the crying and all that nonsense starts. Yeah. But that is what it is, mate, you know? Uh, at the time, how does that make you feel? Like, to, when you're losing your friends and you're like the last man standing, you must think, I actually want to fucking get out of there. Payback, innit? Now, exactly, right? payback. Yeah. The next day you're going looking for a hedge, are you? Simple as uh, that. So it just gives of you course. more aggression, more... Of course, when you've got to go in your room and, like, like sit this right now, and I've got yeah. to pack your gear that night and send it back to your wife. Yeah. Fucking hell, mate, that's heavy duty. That I suppose you want to. Uh, I'll tell you what, in Tikrit, when I got blew up in 207, on my team was actually a lad for one part, right? Swanee, Jordy Swan, God rest him. And he was shot through the neck with a sniper team six weeks before I was blown up. He's on the same team as me, Jordy. And uh, there you go. And you've got to pack his, his box and you're looking, you're sleeping in the same bed space, mate, you know what I mean? Yeah. Nice, mate, you're packing your mate's gear and putting him back to his wife. That's quite sad That's as brutal, well. brutal, Probably. mate, yeah. Brutal. But I think it's a multi thing, eh? You, you put it to the back of your head and go on, mate. Yeah, it's a crack. You've got to, yeah. It's like that on the street as well, mate. You've got to go on, mate. If you lose your mother or father the day, you've got to go on, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, so when you're on these tours, how long was you actually there for? Because you, you can't just say, oh, I've had enough today, I'm going home, can you? It's like, no, no, you're I, there for that time, you've got yeah, to do your time. Oh, do a three month tour, mate, you know? Three months and at a time. You'll find the Americans, they activate, the Americans have got a, a mad, 
it works for them, like. And uh, they'll activate like the reservists for 12, 12 months. Yeah. And they'll put them in country for 12 months, which is quite long, because they get burnt out. He, 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 he'll burn out, you know. Maybe that's why they lose so many men. I don't know. The Brits will they'll, they'll, they'll put people back after three months. Maybe bring them back out again, but they'll definitely recuperate after three months, you know what I mean, and put yeah. them back on, on, on a leave. And that makes sense, you know what I mean? I never see that when I was working as a team leader. I had some days pick a guy and go like that, right, you, you, you've got to go. Because you would just see him going down, down and down. Now he's getting dangerous because he's got everybody else's fucking life on, on the block, isn't it? Yeah. And you just see some guys, you just see it taking his place. One of the telltale signs when they're out there asking you for a mobile phone or asking for a satellite phone or female problems, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I hear, time for you to go home. No good, mate, you know what I mean? Yeah. To start seeing this off side. Ah, you've got, got to a, put that in a basket and go on. I, mate, I suppose you know that mean? makes the team vulnerable, doesn't it? If you've got a, of course. You've got a weak link in there and he's not pulling his weight, it makes the whole team more vulnerable. Uh, of course, uh, and I'll stand there and, and you'll get a guy complaining behind his back and before you know it, you know that, mate, it's time for you to head home, mate, you know yeah. what I mean? And that's just common sense kicking in, you know what I mean, at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But, um, nah, I've no regrets, mate, happy days. So, Gary, when you first come out of the military, you went back into the sort of crime scene, didn't you? You got involved in that again? Uh, I was always there, mate, but from an early age it was always there. So, I mean, you're from a local fucking family, mate, where you've done security on the doors in your area and that. So you've always been involved, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, whether you've been aware or not, you're still who you are when you come back. Yeah. After the bomb and that, I got myself back to fitness and then started getting involved in serious crime again. What, what it, sort of serious crime are we talking well, about? Well, I got charged with organised crime in 2010, mate, I got a four-year sentence for it and uh proceeds of crime kicked in and lost a lot of money well 167 grand to be fucked and then grand. they refused me legal aid which is for your legal team and all that so I had to pay a glasgow firm 48,000 to represent me <laughs> just to get the deal for four years or i was going away for years okay, you know yeah. so that was all signed off and cut off because you've signed the proceeds of crime which basically means i can't walk down the road now with a thousand pound on us and we'll take office Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I had money to go over his left and center. Yeah. So crime definitely doesn't pay. I don't fucking pay, guys, <laughs> I'm telling you, trust me, I don't pay. But uh, no, I regret that side of it, and I was charged with fucking importing Class A drugs up to Scotland and that from down south. That's what it is, you know, that's yeah. where the money was coming from, it's a fuck. Did, so, so was that more of a survival for, for money, for income to live I in? Think, no, I think it's just what you, you, you buy into this fucking gangster carry on, mate, and you think yeah. you, you start believing you, you are what you are, and it's that like, goes to wearing rollies and jumping about in jags and carrying firearms and thinking you're legal, mate, you know? And yeah. that's what happens, mate. Right. A lot of guys up in Scotland have been shot dead, mate, I can assure you that. A lot of my mates are dead. I'm not making excuses for you, but coming from military background, it must feel quite normal to carry a firearm now, hasn't it? Well, some nights I still put a bulletproof vest on to take my dog for a walk, mate. That's a fact. <laughs> Anybody who knows me knows that's true. And there you go. So, and there's an old saying in life, remember this, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, mate, yeah. you know? And if I walked out here the other day and get shot four times, mate, I would never go in court and point a finger at you. Because that goes against what, yeah. what I've been brought up against, mate. It goes against the principle of what I stand for. Yeah. So. Even though I'm not involved in crime now, and I've turned my back and I'm helping a lot of people with, with what I do, I know what I'm, but uh, I still, if I see somebody doing you a wrong one, it's wrong. Yeah. It goes against my principle, mate, you know what I mean? <laughs> to see guys, but one minute they're wanting to do something and take the holidays and spend the monies and that, but the next minute they want to point fingers. Yeah, don't want to, don't do the, don't come well, do the crime. Well, I was an old saying like, hey, don't do the crime if you can't it, do the time, mate, there you go. <laughs> but, so we we'll start to wrap it up there, Gary. Yeah. Anything else you want to tell us before we leave? Nah, you hit the nail right on the head there, mate. You say crime don't pay, so if you can't take from this guy's what I'm trying to put over, it fucking don't, mate, you know? And then, I mean, you see what's happening in London with the cities with the blades and all that. that my message is definitely anti crime, anti knife, anti gun, mate. Yeah. I feel responsible in my own city because I put firearms in there. It's a fact, you know what I mean? And so I've got to be responsible for what I took part in, mate, you know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm dusting right well, you know, I've never dusted a firearm in any area and I wouldn't do it, mate, you know what I mean? I don't know if you're maintaining firearms, you wouldn't do that, but it was known, it was always known to have fucking firearms. I would have been around this for an early age. I just, I just thought that was Did legal. Did come from the military? I don't know, that. mate, no, I've had them before <laughs> the, that. I've had them as kids, I just thought they were legal. <laughs> I just thought they were legal, mate, you know? Yeah. But, nah, that, that was in the past. I'm, I'm making jokes there, mate. 
No, happy days. Thank you guys. Good night, all the best, yeah. Well and hopefully things will work out, yeah. Lovely. Nice one.